Welcome to our second podcast, Calibrating Our Compass, Part 2. In the first session, we talked about correcting the incorrect teachings and what God did not say we are supposed to do. In this video, not only will we talk about God's purpose for this age, but we'll also explain God's plan for the church. I encourage you to turn to the Appendix 3. That's page 234 in the book, and be ready to look at the Disciples' Covenant. Then there's 476 to 1517. Anybody want to guess what 476 was? That's the fall of the Roman Empire. How about 1517? Reformation. Reformation. That's a more common date. That's when Martin Luther tacked the 95 Theses on the Castle Church door, uh, complaining about well, all his complaints about the church, of selling of indulgences and all those things, but it kicked off the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. So uh, this was also a very dark period. Some call it the Dark Ages. So it was a very dark period. This was the period of, of uh, persecution. Uh, the uh, Spanish Inquisition, you heard of that? That's when they had all these torturous methods where they would actually put people on a torture rack and pull them apart. And uh, they would put them in a basket and dunk them into the water for so many seconds and bring them up. Well, you recant. You know, and uh, these are people that refused to have their children baptized by the Catholic Church. Or people that, that read the Bible on their own and they're not supposed to, not allowed to read the Bible. Um, these were people, they were tortured for these types of things. If you started preaching the gospel, you're also in trouble. Now, you could preach the church, try to get people to come to the church. That was good, but you could not preach the gospel. So uh, this was a dark period. And you know what? The Spanish Inquisition was, was a terrible uh, thing that went on for uh, several hundred years, and it was endorsed by the Catholic Church and endorsed by the Pope. So, was the world Christianized during this period? Uh, excuse me, evangelized? No, it wasn't. 1700 was the beginning of the great missionary movement, and many say that's when Christi Christianity really began taking a hold worldwide with uh, a 1700 uh, missionary movement. So is God a failure? No, he's not a failure. So if God is not a failure, then what is God's purpose for this age? There's never been a time in history when he evangelized the entire world. So let's look at another possibility. And I think this gets to the, really God's purpose for the age. What is God's purpose? I believe it's the building of his church. This is a church age. And in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's God's purpose for this age, the building of his church. Okay, so let me just share with you uh, five short observations about the building of his church. First of all, he says that Christ is doing the building. Jesus says, I will build my church. Sometimes we think we're doing it. Well, God uses us, but he's the one that's building his church. And there's a church worldwide, and then it's, uh, it's also localized in the local churches. Uh, most of the time when the New Testament talks about the church, it's talking about a local church. Secondly, it's yet in the future. At least it was when Jesus said it. He said, I will build my church. Talking about future. And, of course, we believe the church began on the day of Pentecost. Uh, number three, he is building his church. It's not John MacArthur's church. It's not uh, whatever famous pastor that you know. It's not their church. It's not uh, uh, Pastor Marco David's church. This is his church. It's Jesus' church. He's the head of the church. And then number four, hell itself will not stop the process. He will build his church. He will not fail in doing that. And God's plan, though not yet begun in Matthew 16, 18, is destined to succeed. So God's purpose for this age is to build his church. Well, what is God's plan then in building his church? What is the plan that, that God wants to accomplish? I think we can see that in the Great Commission, uh, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now this is the great command of Jesus that he gave just before he ascended into heaven. This was the command to the church, and the church is the body, right? The believers. 
It wasn't a command to the disciples. It was a command to every follower of Christ from that moment on. So it's really a command to me, and it's a command to you. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. So uh, <clears throat> when we, uh, we take a look at that, uh, Jesus was up in Mount, Ol Mount of Olives. He, uh, the disciples met him there, and they fell down on their face, and they worshiped the resurrected Christ. And uh, when they worshiped him, they got up, and then Jesus began to gave, give this command. And uh, the command, really, uh, just to, to summarize it briefly, in case you weren't uh, wasn't here when, when we preached on this a few weeks ago, uh, the command here is not to go, even though it says go, therefore. That's not the command in the Greek language. The command is not to uh, baptize, even though it sounds like a command in the passage here. And the command is not to teach. These are adverbial participles that modify the command. In other words, they say, these are things that we need to do to fulfill the command. The command in the Greek language is to make disciples. So the go is assumed. In fact, Kenneth Wee said, the go could be translated in your going, or since you're going, or having gone, make disciples. It's assumed. So see, the disciples just fell down on their face. They worshiped Jesus. And what is a true heartfelt response to real worship? It's service. If you fall down on your face and worship the resurrected Christ, you get up and say to uh, Peter, hey, Peter, let's go fishing. No, you say, let's do it. Let's do what he just said. How are we going to do it? And so Jesus didn't have to say go. He knew they are going to go. They just worshiped him. And he had been discipling them. And so uh, what, he, what he did is said, okay, since you're going to go, this is what I want you to do. Make disciples. And one of the ways... Parts of making disciples, baptizing people, and then teaching them to observe all things once where I've commanded you. And the important thing here in discipling people is the word observe. Because it's not about teaching a lot of knowledge. What good would it be if you taught the entire word of God and the person actually memorized scripture from the first verse to the last verse of the Bible, had the whole Bible memorized and never practiced any of it? What good would that be? It wouldn't be much good, would it? What's good about the Word of God, it's designed to practice. It's designed to do. And so when Jesus gave the Great Commission, <clears throat> he said, I'm not in, in, uh, interested here in imparting knowledge. That's not my commission for you to impart knowledge. My commission for you is to make disciples and help them to observe, to practice everything that I said. And that's what we do in disciple making. We help people practice what the Word of God teaches. So uh, the average church is not doing a very good job. Uh, George Barna said, you know, after studying really for two years, studying the church, he said, the church is comprised of many converts but few disciples. He went on to say almost every church in our country has a, some type of discipleship program or set of activities. But stunningly, few churches have a church of disciples. Now isn't that amazing? Since this is the Great Commission, there's not an evangelical church in the world that wouldn't agree that we need to fulfill the Great Commission. Yet, we're not doing it. We're doing a very poor job in making disciples. You know, the Super Bowl is coming up pretty soon. And uh, uh, I think the uh, church is a lot like a football game. 22 men down on the playing field desperately needing rest and 70,000 spectators in the grandstand desperately needing exercise. That's what the church is like sometimes. In fact, did you know there's two kinds of pillars in the church? There's the kind to hold the church up, and there's some of those pillars are here today. You hold the church up, and it's, it's these pillars that really make it possible for the church to continue. Then there's another kind of pillar. That's the caterpillar. <laughs> That's the kind that crawl in and out on Sunday morning. Why are there so many caterpillars in the church? Why are there so many people who have been saved 20 years, and what do they do in the church? Nothing. They might come every week, but they're not really involved. They're not actively involved. Why do, you know, we talk about the 20-80 rule. 20% 20 of the people doing 80% of the work. Why is that? That should not be. If anything, it should just be reversed. That 80% of the people are doing most of the work. You know, we, we need to all be involved in it. It's our church. And, and God has given us spiritual gifts. He's given us the Word of God as our, our uh, teaching tool. He's also provided the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to accomplish great things through us. Isn't that amazing?
And so we really ought to be involved in accomplishing the, the great commission of the church. So uh, in the Greek language, the word for disciple is methetis. And uh, what that literally means is, is learner or in, uh, apprentice. Uh, the problem is most churches take that word methetis and they say, well, let's see, we have a lot of learners. Look at all the learners we have. We're discipling people. But the problem is, uh, when you interpret the Word of God, not only do you interpret it by the literal meaning of the word in the Greek language or the Hebrew language for the Old Testament, but you also have to be concerned about the cultural application. How, what was meant at the time that it was spoken. And so if we go back and look at uh, disciple making back in the early church, or even go back before that, uh, Christ's time, even before that, we talked about Socrates and Plato and and, uh, and we could talk about the Sadducees and Pharisees and John the Baptist, all these people that made disciples, and look at what was meant by disciple-making in that day. It was always, uh, the disciple always had a relationship with the master. It was always a, a relational approach. They didn't have pens and paper to write things down. They memorized everything the master said. They, they uh, learned it, but not only the information, they learned to live what he said. They wanted to be like the master, so they emulated the master. They followed the master. They did what the master did and became little uh, uh, replicas, so to speak, of the master. That was what was understood in that day of making a disciple. So when Jesus made a disciple, that's what the disciples understood them to be, uh, replicas of their master. And uh, so if you got in your time machine and went back, to the Mount of Olives, and you were there when Jesus gave the Great Commission, and you saw Jesus ascend into heaven, and you reached over to Peter and you said, Peter, he just said, make disciples. How do we do that? You know what Peter would have said? He would have said, we do it the way Jesus did it. I mean, that's, that's the only thing I know, the way Jesus did it. The only difference is everybody before this made disciples of themselves, and Jesus made disciples of himself. We don't do that. I never make a disciple of John Thompson. No believer makes a disciple of himself. That's the main change, is we make disciples of Jesus. Amen. He's the one. Amen. So, uh, so ch when churches say, well, Methodists, we've got a lot of disciples, but are you making disciples? Uh, as I said before, we're never called to do discipleship. We're called to make disciples. So we have to be asking that all the time. In our uh, activities, our, our, the things that we do in the church, how is this advancing the cause of making disciples? How can we get more people involved in making disciples? This is really the Great Commission. Now, I'm not talking about uh, mentoring here. Some people use the term mentoring as disciple-making. If you want to call disciple-making a spiritual mentoring, that's okay. If, you, if that's what you mean by disciple-making, spiritual mentoring, then that would be good. But typically, mentoring is, is training somebody in a skill. You might train somebody, you might mentor somebody to be a good wife or a good husband. You might mentor somebody to be a, a good leader in uh, director of Awana. You might mentor somebody to become uh, a pastor. You know, there's different th things that you can mentor people to do. But making disciples has to do with spiritual development. And yes, there's some mentoring involved. In fact, when I disciple somebody, I train them how to lead a person to Christ. In a sense, that's a little piece of mentoring. I want them to learn their spiritual gifts and learn how to use their spiritual gifts. I, I mentor them to how to study the Word of God and how to find things in Scripture. Uh, they're being mentored by watching me how to disciple another person. So there's some mentoring, but for the most part, it's more of a spiritual development rather than a skills development approach. God's plan is to make disciples. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. By the way, other Gospels have the Great Commission. They're not all as complete as the Matthew passage. In Mark, it says, go into all the world and preach the Gospel. You see, bringing a person to salvation is the first step of disciple-making. You can't make a disciple until you bring a person to Christ. But you can bring a lot of people to salvation in Christ without making a disciple. And so that's why you can see the genius of Jesus Christ telling us to make disciples. It includes evangelism. Evangelism, discipleship is the front and back of the same coin. Every disciple 
needs to be equipped and burdened to win people to Jesus Christ. But that starts the process. But we have to have it deep in our mind that when we lead somebody to Christ, we don't end there. We have to go on and uh, help them to grow spiritually. Either hand them over to somebody else to disciple them or do it ourselves. We're never to leave a person, a baby Christian, sitting there with no spiritual nourishment and growth.